Welcome back, everybody. Day two of To Catch a Rudy. Okay, we're going to continue our Q&A adventure, everybody. I hope you guys liked yesterday's fascinating questions. Today, we left, yesterday we left off on the uh, YouTube channel earnings. People were asking how much money was made on the YouTube channel. I was talking about the low of 4000 a month, the high of, can, like, on the highs 10 to 15, even spiked to 20. Next question. Rudy, Sarah Angel or Liliana the Veil, which one would you want in your bedroom? Liliana's more feisty. She wants to take on life. She realizes there's only one shot in this world, and that's very attractive. The problem is, Sarah Angel was the original, the loyalty, the nostalgia. I'd have to stay with Sarah, even though Liliana's very alluring and the temptation is there. Rudy, what's the biggest financial flop you've experienced in your career selling tabletop games? Specifically, <clears throat> Is there anything you could have done to fix or correct or prevent that from happening? So, I would say in Magic the Gathering, by far, I would say the number one thing is going to be Dragon's Maze. I bet real heavy on Dragon's Maze, hundreds of boxes, at like $80 a box many, many years ago. And um, you have to remember at the time, since they contained two, fetch two shock lands inside the Dragon's Maze box, plus the set at release, a lot of the cards have value, not just Voice of Resurgence. There was a lot of money in the set, but the problem is it completely dissolved as time went on. It retained zero demand secondary market. It completely collapsed, everybody. So to prevent it, I don't think there was anything I could have prevented something like that. There's just no way around it. Rudy, do you actively wish for the downfall of Wizards of the Coast or the Magic the Gathering community? And do you have health insurance? Okay, I don't understand why the downfall of Wizards. I was Health insurance? Yes. I don't know. That's a weird... I'm assuming that's something to do with the Wedge, GoFundMe, Vegas, hospital thing. Because it's just a random question to throw in the middle. Rudy, do you actively wish the downfall of Wizards, though? I actually do not. As I stated in yesterday's part one, um, I firmly believe in the whole time heals all, time naturally progresses and kind of takes care of things. As things get real bad, the system, there's systems in place to kind of reset things. So I think it's kind of like a self-healing, self-fulfilling thing, self-correcting process. Rudy, elaborate more on alternative investing in things like rare books, art, wine, magic cards, etc. Um, that's a very complicated thing. Personally, I do dabble in the old wine type of world, but it's not what you all think. I'm very heavily involved in something I've never really talked about. I was thinking about doing a video on it, but I thought most of you would be bored by it. Everybody knows there's Marilyn Monroe stuff in my background. I'm a very big fan of that 1940s, 50s, 60s type of era with the old world mafia type Vegas thing, the Frank Sinatra Rat Pack and Marilyn Monroe and the stories and the people and the culture back then. Um, there is a line of wine that is produced in, uh, it's probably a Napa Valley thing, and uh, they do a Marilyn Merlot series since the 80s. Um, I do have the entire collection, I think it's like one or two bottles from the beginning, and you can Google Marilyn Merlot, and you guys can look it up. And I collect it every year. And each bottle has a different piece of artwork from Marilyn Monroe on the release of the wine every year. The older bottles and years tend to get <clears throat> very, very expensive, up to a couple thousand dollars a bottle. And when they come out, they're usually only between twenty and thirty-five dollars a bottle. So I collect it every year just because I like the artwork. Shocker, sound familiar? And eventually, as time went on, it just became like this investable thing that is very nostalgic to me so it's kind of ironic so rudy congratulations on 150k subscribers thank you this is the 150k q a for those of you just joining us you taught me a lot about the evil world of investing easy question for you do you think the vintage magic community and all the vintage magic cards are currently in a bubble and do you think it's about to pop and what do you think the future value of this stuff i do not believe the vintage magic cards or the old stuff is in a bubble it's very, very different than other hobbies like the, you know, Beanie Babies, Teletubbies, you know, baseball card, sports card crash of the 90s. It's a very different thing in my opinion. Um, I do believe, this is very important, I do firmly believe the extreme growth we had in the last 24 months was nothing more than a correction because the last 10 years we had no growth. So we had all the growth occur at one time. Because of that, I actually do believe over the next five years, moving forward, based on right now, mid-2018, I actually think we're going to have very little returns and very little growth in the next few years. 
So if you're thinking about leveraging up and borrowing money, credit cards, lines of credit, you know, if you have a HELOC, whatever you do, be very careful. I do not think the returns are going to be very dramatic over the next couple of years. I think we've plateaued in the short term because of the amount of adjustment. The market needs to settle and cool off now. Rudy, <clears throat> what was the shadiest company you ever had to deal with? Um, when I was in the financial world, um, one of the firms I dealt with was Waddell and Reed Incorporated. They were a broker dealer. I was not a big fan of them. Um, in the magic world, you guys aren't going to like to hear this, but the distributors are probably the shadiest part of the Magic the Gathering world. Not Wizards of the Coast, not your local game store, not the evil investors, not the 1.6.69% women. It's probably distributors in the magic world. Rudy, when did you buy out all of these Serendib Afrites, Arabian Night versions? Uh, I did not do an actual buyout, but I have been continuing to buy continuous amounts of them over the last 12 months I've been building my position. Um, after researching and being exposed to some different people in Vegas in 2018 um, and playing some old school, because I actually played and learned how to play Magic last month, um, I've, in, my, in my opinion, I agree with the other people that Serendipa Free was substantially undervalued, and we got some really cool, fun videos coming with that particular item, so I don't spend too much time on it. But I do believe it should be very similarly priced to Jujam Dijin. All right, Rudy, when will Wizards of the Coast start printing Purdy Women again? Um, I think this goes back to what I talked about in the previous Q&A. I think as Wizards drifts in different directions with culture, art, quality, card stock, how they treat the game... There's a lot of self-correcting circuit breaker type things in place. When sales go down, they react. When things go up, they get excited and giddy. Then they keep redoing master sets until they fail. When From the Vault keeps going and going until they screw it up, they discontinue it. Dual decks, they make them a long time. People love them. Then they drift. They screw up. They discontinue it. Wizards, it's the same thing if you feel like the women and the type of physical appearance that the women should have on the artwork. Personally... I understand, I agree with the more beauty type curves of the women in the artwork, but that's not as big of a variable to me as I like the old style artwork, where it's more of a hand-drawn raw feel, more so than the women, because it versus the CGI computer style graphics. It's a little bit different. I like the old style of artwork more than I do the computer generated. That's my issue more so. That's the number one issue with this artwork, in my opinion. And then, of course, you got the smaller issues like how they portray maybe the men, the women, the culture, and the little things in between. But I think number one, in my opinion, remains the computer-generated fake feel versus the raw, drawn artwork. I think that's really the most important, everybody. Rudy, do you read the books in your bookshelf in the background, like the old Arabian Night books and the H.G. Wells type stuff? Um, when I was younger, I did read a lot of them. Not all the way through. I would always lose focus and go drift somewhere else. Um, now with my lifestyle, my culture, the working, the schedule I keep of, you know, going like 15 hours a day, usually doing on a, on a slow day, I'll do like an eight hour day on a, of working and doing things on a busy day. I'll do like a full 12, 14 hours. Um, so no, I don't really have time to do that anymore. Rudy, what do you think Wizards of the Coast about policing the community? How do you think policing Wizards of the Coast police department affects the player base? Well, we touched on this in the first part also. Um, but the only reason I added this again is because this person wants to know how do you think it affects the player base. Um, I think part of the player base is happy with it. There is a segment, it may be a small segment, but there's a few people that do like that kind of thing. The problem is, by acting like the police department, instead of focusing on just making good magic cards, you alienate and you make a chunk of the player base unhappy. Whether you like that chunk of the player base or you hate that chunk of the player base, it is completely indifferent in the world of running a publicly traded company when it's all about numbers, capitalism, shareholders. Where you should not even, that shouldn't even be a category of discussion when trying to run a successful company. That'd be like me having the restaurant or I bring food or I go on a military base and I'm not willing to you know, give food to a certain squadron because they're older or they're younger or they have a certain demographic. I mean, why would I want to lose the business because that person, those people like my food, but they may be younger, older, or look different. Like, who would want to run their business in the ground like that? So, that's my opinion on it. Do I think it does affect the player base? Absolutely. Um, you guys can believe it or not, but I've read many collections and the letters that are included. And the collections do cite people in the letters when they sell me things, have cited on many occasions. I'd say 30% of the time, they have cited as one, not the sole reason... But one of many reasons for selling, they have cited that as one variable. Rudy, we get it. You're a vape guy. 
Again, sorry, just like the previous video, I do not engage in any smoking. I barely ever drink. I may drink a glass of wine once every three months or may get a drink if I hang out with a bunch of friends. I really don't drink. I've never even smoked a cigarette. I am really, honestly, I'm too cheap for that stuff now. Rudy, would you ever sell your collection? In what circumstances would you actually sell your collection? Me selling the collection is going to be more of an issue of a lifestyle change, not more so about the money. It's going to be more of a when I decide to move on to a new chapter of my life or I, there's something better, greater, or bigger business opportunity comes along. Uh, some of my other business things I've been working on, I still want because I've already done that. I got the rental property stuff. I do all that, the bonds. One thing I really want to, I still want to do is I'd like to purchase an entire commercial shopping center. Not a mall. I don't like malls. That's old school. But I'd like a retail shopping center or like a retail office complex, a really high-end one. And I'd like to do that entire thing. And as I said before, guy, I hiccups like crazy, sorry. Like I've stated before, I'd like to move my operation to the large office complex and take like three big units and make a high-end fancy store, card store, logistics, everything, warehouse, and then take the rest of the units and rent them out to cover the overhead of my magic empire. I've really wanted to take that direction, but again, I just haven't put much time into it since last year when I first mentioned it on Card Shop Life when I started with the Alpha Investments location when we opened it. Rudy, what do you think of the current state of the U.S. economy? Um, it's good. It's suspiciously good, and it's scary good how things are. Things are so good right now, economically, financially, Wall Street, uh, real estate, and everything. It makes me nervous. That's the best way I can sum it up. Rudy, have you ever struggled with depression? That's a sensitive topic, everybody. I don't mind talking about it. Um, personally, I have not. There's been, there's been times in my life where I'm depressed, where I'm just like, ugh, or I'm just really a Debbie Downer. I don't know if that was a form of depression or not. I'm not very in tune with that. But there, was, there has been many times I'm very negative. I've been, I've been called a very negative person many, many parts of my life. Um, I don't really attribute it to maybe like a depression, but I don't know, maybe, maybe that is it, and I just don't realize it. Um, but there's been waves. I do, I do go through a lot of emotional ups and downs and waves. I do have that. But again, I deal with a lot of things where some days a bunch of things go good and I feel like I'm on top of the world. And then other days I get hosed, there's disputes against me, everyone's, there's a new thing everyone's trying to attack me about, make fun of me about. You know, I got a new wave on Reddit where they're talking about now I'm trying to hose the Timmies or Rudy's trying to manipulate. You know, there is swing. So, you know, I experience a lot of ups and downs based on, you know, just day-to-day -day stuff, which is one of the reasons that I don't use any social media because there's, there's zero benefit for my personal life. I can't find a benefit in using it, which is why I have no Facebook. I really don't have an active Twitter. I don't have any form of Instagram, Snapchat. I don't have anything. So, Rudy, can you go into more details about bond ETFs or bond mutual funds? Have you ever lost money on bonds? Yes. If so, which ones and how much? Do you leverage yourself to buy bonds? Not currently, but in the past, yes. I have been leveraged over six figures into buying individual corporate bonds. Um, I did not do municipal bonds years ago because I didn't have a tax issue because I didn't have any money. Um, yes, I've lost money on bonds because I've had multiple bonds default on me over the years because I tend to buy more of the borderline junk bond or high yield bond because I don't like AAA, AA, single A rated bonds. I like triple B, double B rated bonds. I like the mid range where companies are profitable, they can pay their bills, but they may not be experiencing growth. They may be having challenges where the stock price is declining, but I, I feel very confident that they will have enough money to not go out of business. Therefore, a bond is a good direction to go. So, you know, to get details on that, I'll probably do some story times, everybody. Rudy, what, do you, what drives you crazier? Social justice warriors, SJWs, or New Yorkers moving to Florida? <laughs> um, honestly, I... I Honestly, I'd probably say, I guess some of the SJW stuff does bother me. Some of it doesn't. It really depends on what it is. Those are people that feel very firmly about their beliefs, which, you know, I respect the beliefs just because I agree with some of it and I agree with, I disagree with some of it. It doesn't really bother me. I mean, I don't like it when they attack or physically attack people, like when they attack Jeremy, somebody. I don't like the idea of people arguing online and it turns into a physical thing. You know, I don't think that solves anything. As far as New Yorkers in Florida... For some reason, everybody thinks I don't really sound like a Southern Florida guy. I talk very Northern-like, and I'm actually a Florida person, so I can't really say anything negative about that. Rudy, you should talk about your education. Tell me about your history. Um, not really a whole lot to talk about. Uh, I went to high school here in North Florida. Went to college, University of North Florida. Um, business degree. 
uh, specialty in corporate finance. Um, did the broker stuff, got a bunch of certifications and broker's licenses and series different licenses, and that's really about it. Not really anything special, everybody. Rudy, how much do you earn a month? My income fluctuates big time. On a bad month, it could be like five or ten thousand. On a on a blowout, amazing month, something amazing happens to me, it could spike to like over fifty. But again, there's no set again. And there's months where I've, you know, I've had to do a, a special thing with the patrons where I didn't make any of the twenty thousand, for example, on the patron money, and I've actually lost additional. There's, it's been both ways. Rudy, how much do you actually play Magic now? Pretty much I don't. I don't have any time to. I play a little bit in Vegas. I haven't played since Vegas, which has been three months. I haven't played a single game of Magic. I would like to, but my schedule, if I don't, if I don't, if I play the game of Magic for an hour, that's pretty much, you know, you know, if I get 50 patron messages a day, that's pretty much 20 patrons who aren't going to get a reply that day. That's how I look at it. Rudy, you clearly stated you believe the reserve list is an iron lock. If for whatever reason Wizards decide to actually change the policy, what would be the most reasonable implementation of that change for all parties involved? Number two, is there still a thrill of adding to your collection or have you bought so much reserve list it doesn't even get a rise out of you anymore? That's a good question, everybody. Number one, if they were going to do get rid of the reserve list and do something weird, I don't think it's ever going to happen. I think they would slowly do it over like a 10, 20 year period. And even then... When they redid it, it's going to be on new card stock, different art, different card frame. It, it doesn't even matter. People want the originals. It's like Action Comics number one or a Honus Wagner baseball card. I can go on eBay and buy one for five bucks. But why do people spend millions on the original? Same concept. Really doesn't make any difference at this point in time. Oh, it's getting dark out there. I hope it doesn't rain and get too loud so you guys can hear me. Um, as far as the second part here, that is a personal thing. I'm going to be honest with everybody. Because of the, the business I'm engaged in and how I'm doing this, I've lost a lot of excitement for buying reserve list cards or crazy stuff or anything, you know. I can have, you know, stacks of, you know, wastelands, which aren't your reserve list, whatever, or whatever this card is, you know, and just a bunch of Arabian Nights, so wait, just comment... And, you know, when you end up dealing with so much of it, it, it does desensitize you. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie. Everybody ha has this dream of, I wish I had these cards. The problem is, what everybody fails to realize is, you want it because you don't have it. You want, you want the journey. You want the desire and the process, the challenge, the, the rush. It's the same thing of people who use these, you know, online dating sites and Tinder and hooking up and dating or playing a video game or playing a really hard game of magic or doing something risky in life. It's all the same thing. People, the brain tends to misconstrue the journey versus the actual item many times. And I've been having a lot of self-reflection on that because I don't, you know, five, ten years ago, when I got a Black Lotus, it was just like a big deal to me for like a month straight. Every day I would just stare at it. And now, if I buy a collection with a Lotus, after an hour and I get done or make the video and I finish doing the collection and negotiation, by the next day it's locked up. I don't look at it. I don't even, I inventory it, I lock it up and that's it. And it doesn't do it. I don't get that rise, that rush. You know, when that, when that amazing, when that hot chick walks by, it just, you get desensitized. I mean, we all have this rush where if you're a, if you're a dude, you're just like, oh my God, look at all these hot chicks. I'd like to hook up with, I like to do, okay, what if, pretend for a second, you could. Believe it or not, no matter how you feel about it, oh my god, yeah, Rudy, what are you talking about? You're crazy, bro. No, at the end of the day, if you could do anything you wanted, after 30 days, it wouldn't be special. You wouldn't enjoy it. And that goes with literally dating men and women. That goes with doing things, jobs, money, investing. It's all the same thing. Just different variables placed into the sentence. That's all it is. Rudy, <clears throat> how many black lotuses do you own? And what's the best sauce to use on my floppy taco? I usually use hot sauce, but lately, even in the old video, I've been using mild sauce because I just like to enjoy the flavor versus having the spiciness. How many black lotuses do I own? I think I have 12 now. So, um, five are graded. Seven are not. Rudy, what is your feelings on how quickly the, down, the goodwill <coughs> wizards built by making good magic sets like Dominaria was lost and the negativity came back when M19 came out and didn't sell good. <clears throat> what do you feel about that? I played Magic in 94, 95. Dominaria felt like the old 90s. And then M19 felt like 
the 2000s again? That's an interesting question. Um, I actually think M19 is a pretty good set. I actually think M19 is going to age very well. The fact M19 is not selling well, Wizards is going to cut off production early. Which also means, I predict, in two, three years from now, I actually think M19, just like Dominaria, I actually think both of those boxes are probably going to become an investable item because I do think they will appreciate to over $100 a box from the market price right now of 90 I actually think that's a very highly probable thing. And everybody made fun of me, and the same thing with Conspiracy. Everybody made fun of me with Conspiracy 2, Take the Crown. Everybody made fun of me with Kaladesh. I remember the last three months I offered Kaladesh, Aether Revolt, Conspiracy 1 and 2 to the patrons. The last month before I took it off the patron list, um, literally nobody even bought it. Out of all 1,700 patrons, people didn't want it anymore. Now Kaladesh is like 120 on a box in English on eBay. Same thing with Conspiracy 1 and 2. They're pushing over 120 plus. This time next year, I predict they'll be 150. And, you know, it's just the problem is people get emotional in the short term and they don't, they don't have the ability to tend to look long term. They get very blinded by things. <clears throat> Rudy, how does having millions of dollars in magic cards affect your insurance rates? And are they insured separately from your regular business home insurance? <clears throat> oh, sorry, my voice lately today. So my home insurance and my business insurance does have higher amounts of personal belonging insurances. But you got to keep in mind, homeowner's insurance, business insurance only will cover so much in certain categories. Uh, I do not keep all my cards in my house. I do not keep all my cards in the business. They are split apart for this particular reason. I don't think it's insurance as big of a deal as it is to diversify and spread out and hedge the risk. I think that's a better strategy than buying these supposed insurance policies, everybody. Now... Rudy, what's your favorite format to play and why? Um, I used to be old school um, type 1.5 or extended, was they used to call it. Um, and then I actually, I never played modern. I never played standard. I mean, I, I played it. But I, I never really got into the meta and all this crap and net deck. I don't care about that. Um, I still like 93, 94. I like the old school, raw, ridiculous, stupid, overpowered, underpowered, you know, pay to win. I, I like the emotion and the swings, the highs and lows, and the anger that it's unfair. I like the feel of it. It's very, and I love Arabian Nights and Urzas. Arabian Nights, the Dijins and Afrits, and how there's cards that just kill the Dijins and Afrits, and there's just and how the Dijins and Afrits, you know, they hurt you for using them because they're kind of two faced. I, I I love it. I love it. So <clears throat> never played Popper. I have played Commander, uh, even the pre-con decks. That was actually pretty fun. This was Commander. I played like Commander 2014 or 2015 decks years ago. I just took them out and played with them before I sold some. It was fun. Rudy, what do you think of Richard Garfield's new approach to the Keyforge TCG? As with all TCGs, Transformers TCG, good luck. Keyforge, good luck. Keyforce, I'm sorry, not Keyforge. I'm not going to touch it. If it stands the test of time after a couple years, continues to boom, becomes a big thing. We'll discuss it then. I don't believe in it. Rudy, what is your biggest, most embarrassing, funniest, Magic card game investment related screw up. I don't mean the biggest loss you've had. I mean stuff like opening a box and slicing through the packs, having to redo a video because you spilled a drink on something. That's actually kind of funny. Actually destroying a valuable card. I'll be honest with everybody. I don't really knock on wood. Knock on wood. I actually don't have a lot of screw ups. Um, I'm actually very, very careful in the videos while looking like they're random at the store and the office and everything, they're really not very random. Everything is very strategically placed in the backgrounds, the pictures, the artwork, the bookcase, the way things are moved, the angles, the lighting, everything is tested ahead of time. There's no liquids around. Like right now I have a glass of water because the table is clear. I, I don't, I'm very, very cautious to prevent screw ups, especially if it's a patron box opening. If any form of a box opening video, then I cannot cut the video. I can't do anything. It says, I know it's a hit play. You can't touch it. Those are the most sensitive videos. And I go out of my way to make sure the battery is fully charged. I have a backup charger plugged into it. I make sure nothing can interrupt. Phone and everything's on airplane mode. I take it very seriously to prevent things. So I actually, fortunately, I don't have anything crazy. Rudy? Uh, sorry. Rudy, I really don't like you. I never really liked you because of this stigma that you were just a rich person wanting to manipulate the market which hurts lower income working individual players. But after watching more of your videos, I actually have respect for you and you have decent opinion on things, even though, so it sounds like this person doesn't like me, but it, it actually sounds like this is more of a case which is very common, which I'm gonna make some videos on, regarding like the reserve list and the prices, the has versus have nots, which creates a very strong emotional reaction by people. I think that's a very big thing going on. 
I don't think it's how much you like or dislike me or another YouTuber. I think it's more... I don't... Um, I think it's more... It's frustration. It's emotion. Because, like, the person who left me this comment... I mean, they literally... I mean, the person says, I don't really like you. Because the way your stigma is, the rich person, the cards you show... And it's not really the person dislikes me. I think they dislike the idea of somebody doing what I'm doing to the market. And no matter how this person feels, or I feel, or you guys feel watching this, this YouTube channel and what I'm doing is having a substantial impact on the market or on the industry. Especially of magic, especially old stuff. And no matter, there's no way to deny that. At the beginning, I used to kind of joke about the influence of this channel on the magic market and the old stuff. I used to think it was silly. But the reality of it is it's to the point now. I mean, my channel on a normal day now is 100,000 views. That's a, on a low day, 90,000 views. And lately, on a normal day, it's been 140,000 views a day. And busy days are now 200 to 250,000 views a day. So, <clears throat> I mean, when you run the numbers, that's a lot of market reach. So, therefore, no matter how I feel about it, I do understand that it does affect the market, which is why, you know, some people hate me because of the idea... My influence on how I played a game with Bizarre Baghdad. And of course, ever since I did that, the price never went back down because I never sold the cards back. I still have them all. And I had no intentions to. And unlike previous people who tried to do the old pump and dumps, the problem is when you don't put anything back, the chart doesn't really retrace back to the previous level. When I bought all the Bizarre Baghdads, I bought them for between $500 and $600 for played. And mint ones were between six and $700, maybe $750. And now, I mean, the price is pretty much double. Mint or mint really nice ones are fifteen hundred to two thousand, and crappy played ones are pretty much a thousand to fifteen hundred. Every once in a while, you can one for maybe eight and nine hundred if it's real rough, but the prices aren't going to retrace. And the fact of the matter is, if I didn't put my fifty to hundred of them back, they're not going to go back down. And the fact every time one comes up in a collection or they go on sale on eBay, and I get an eBay ten percent bucks, and somebody does put one for a thousand, and I can get a hundred bucks off, that's nine hundred dollars credit card cash back. I'm going to pay 870 bucks. You bet your butt I'm going to buy another one, you know. So I understand the frustration of why people don't like me, but I don't think it's really me. Because even when I've gone to local GPs and events or stores, I've run to people. These people shake my hand, take selfies, and I sign stuff for them. And they say to me, Rudy, I don't like you, but I, I like you as a person. But I don't like what you're doing. And, it, you know, and, and then I've had people just say, I don't like the idea of you or I don't like your impact because I can't do it. I don't like how you're manipulating the market because it's not fair. And but I really respect you as a person. I, it's very interesting how the conversations have gone. So, Rudy, I read your descriptions. Why in your video is it one point six nine 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 percent women less than your previous video? So the percentage of women on the video, as all of you know, I change the number in every video because it's pretty much an internet meme. Because everybody, because ever since Wizards came out and said 40% of the Magic the Gathering player base is women, it became an internet meme. Because everybody, even people I've talked to who work for Wizards or Channel Fireball events or anyone, everybody just kind of snickers at 40% being women. You can literally walk around. You can go to any store in the country, you can go to any GP, you can go to any Pro Tour. I personally believe... The number of women in Magic have increased. I used to think it was 3 to 5%. Recently, in my honest opinion, I actually think it's between 5 and 15% depending on demographics. I actually do think the quantity of women has increased. But at the same time, I do think the total number of players has decreased from 5 years ago. So while maybe a certain demographic has ticked up by a couple percent, the overall player base between all genders and races has declined, which is the important number to follow. You should not be a company focusing on a certain demographic or trying to get more minorities. We need to get more Asians. No, Hispanics. No, white people. Black people. Or, or wait, maybe certain religions. That's silly. You need to look at the total number. Why are you gaining? Why are you losing? What can we do to make people feel more welcome? And in Wizards' eyes, I think they believe that they are doing the right thing. And the reality of it is they don't know what the hell they're doing. And I genuinely think they just don't know. They're not trying to do it on purpose. They're genuinely just not, they don't have the skill set. It's, it's not a question of the Wizards people being SJWs or capitalists or socialists or Wall Street or Democrat, Republican or you know, a Hillary or a Trump. I don't think any of that really matters. 
I think it's just they're just not skilled. They don't possess the correct skill set to take the position to manage that kind of an empire. That's what I think it really comes down to. So, Rudy, do you think the Social Justice Goblin YouTube channel is XCIA, or what do you think of this person? I think that individual is a very strange cookie. I think it's a good-hearted individual, but I think it's got a lot of. Uh, I think. I think. He, I, I think she's got a lot of historical. Been through a lot. And it reflects on that individual. So, I, And I don't know the person enough to really comment about the personal life. But I think it's somebody who's seen a lot of things. And actually has a lot of experience. But it's probably dealing with a lot of things, even in real life. But again, who isn't? I think we all are, right? Rudy, how does a secondary market for bonds work? Since Okay, that's a complex question. And like I said, we're only doing 30, 40 minute videos, everybody. But this is, I only buy bonds in the secondary market. I don't think I've ever said that. I do not buy new issue bonds. I do not buy government bonds. I do not buy treasury or agency bonds. Honestly, I really don't buy muni bonds. I only buy secondary market corporate bonds. I'm not a big fan of zero coupon bonds. I'm not a big fan of adjustable rate bonds or step up bonds or callable bonds or all these different things or different attributes or different traits they add to it because they're always in favor of the company versus the investor. I'm not a fan of that. I like to buy bonds in the secondary market. That's my number one favorite thing to do. I like to find people in the secondary market who has, you know, a Royal Caribbean Cruise Line bond. It's a 10-year bond. That person's held it for three years, and they're selling it at a discount. I like to buy it at a discount and take over the remainder seven years and then wait for maturity. I, that's my favorite thing to do. Rudy, what's the biggest loss you've ever had on an MTG deal? Again, like I said before, I think it's going to be the Dragon's Maze thing just because I bought so many boxes and it just completely collapsed. And because it was overprinted and it was just a disaster. And the funny thing is, did you guys know Dragon's Maze was put out of print early because the sales were so bad? They cut it off early still. Can you imagine if they didn't? Dear Rudy, how do you feel about prepping in case the grid, the power grid ever goes down? Is there literally a, an SHTF, was that like shut the hell or shut the front door, get the fuck out scenario? Is there a hidden Rudy bunker somewhere with enough taco stockpile to sustain me for years? Okay, I'm not really a prepper type thing. I don't really have a bunker, unfortunately. But if some of you would like to see it, I've thought about it. Um, I put a significant amount of money. I do own an industrial generator by Generac. And it's a 30,000 watt. And it's custom wired to my house and businesses where I can literally sustain and run for about a month straight off the grid. And it actually has, it uses a, it has a, on top, it has like built-in, it's like monster, like 20-gallon, like Honda gas tanks. And I have like 300 gallons storage for fuel. I'm really big into that, but mostly that's because I live in Florida. And we get, if, if and or when, we actually get a major hurricane, not little stuff where I'm out of power. Um, I need to stay operational, especially with the heat. And um, the house that I custom built that I live in is also a non-wood frame. It's a solid cinder block rebar designed to handle 150-mile-an-hour winds with roof with steel rods that hold the roof down to the base. I spent a lot of extra money designing this type of a project in case of a extreme weather scenarios. It's also higher off the ground than a normal house by an extra couple feet. You kind of walk up to the foyer, there's steps going up. So it looks good from the street, kind of has that nice look, but it's also higher for flooding purposes. So I have a lot of little things like that in place, but I don't really have a bunker per se. If you guys would like to see a video, where I show like the generator and go over that, let me know. I would be kind of a fun thing to do. All right. Where are we? Rudy, what changed in Magic since the 90s? And what you like and what do you not like? Honestly, to sum that up without making a whole video, I like the I miss the 90s because I felt the culture was deeper and people respected the culture more because it wasn't mainstream. Magic and video games now are so mainstream. It's treated differently and it's lost its roots. You guys have heard me talk about how far off magic is from its roots. About the player bases and how anti-white I mean, how anti -white people or how anti-certain things or artwork has to be approved and sensitive. Or Okay, now even the, now the card stock has to be modified. Everything's been tweaked and modified in categories. And unfortunately, you know, that's not really my opinion. That's just stating what, you know, the actual Wizards of the Coast, Mark Rosewater people have said. I mean, these are just what they've stated. So, I mean, whether I agree or disagree with it, it's indifferent. This is just how they feel. So, yes, I feel we're really far away from our roots, and I think it's had a lot of impact on the video game, the comic, 
the magic, and honestly, culture as a whole. I really do, everybody. It kind of reminds me of the cars. Remember in the early 2000s, everybody souped up their cars with spoilers, body kits, nitrous, turbo, the import scene, muscle cars, and now you just don't see that. I mean, honestly, just go out and buy a Tesla, one, the P1000, and you have like a rocket ship and just call it a day. Rudy, how does it bother you being a national sex symbol? I wish I was, but I am nowhere near muscular in shape. I'm pale white. Uh, I've got some nice, look at these. All look good, you guys? Hold, hold on. I mean, I'm just not, you can turn that into a meme for those of you watching. I mean, I'm just not a super tan sex symbol, sorry. I wish I was. Rudy, what drives you to be the beast that you are? What makes you get up in the morning, eat tacos? How do you do it? How do you get the ambition, the passion? What sparked you to get like that? All right, so it first started because the infamous next door neighbor lost me, hosed me, wrecked me. I never thought I'd be in a relationship again. I lost a lot of respect for life, and I guess that would be my downtime in life. It turned me into a workaholic. I'm going to prove everybody that me and my magic cards are going to build an empire and give the world a middle finger. How'd that work out? So that would be the very first thing that sparked the very beginning of everything. Uh, second, I never wanted to go to college at a high school, and I used to lie to friends in school, saying I'm going to go to a fancy college because I wasn't even going to go to college. But if, I, if you say that you're not going to college in high school, that's deemed as a loser or negative. So I wanted to lie to fit in because I was young and stupid. Now I know when people talk about what do I want to do, if you don't know what you want to do, don't fucking go to college. It's a waste of money, dude. It's stupid. Don't be a part of the system and get in student loan debt so you can get out and get a regular job anyways. Why don't you be smart and learn a trade, do something with your life, or find something on your own that you're passionate about. Rudy, if someone approaches you with a newly released trading card game, would you invest in it? No. I don't care how good or bad the trading card game is. I don't. There's nothing that you could probably bring me that's going to wow me at this point in time. I've had tons of card games come and go. Some are pretty cool. Exodus, the Mega Core, the new Transformer TCG. Oh, please. Yeah, right. The new Richard Garfield game, Lightseekers, all that stuff. Good luck. I mean, I, I respect all these people for trying, but the market, I don't believe in the market. It's not that I don't believe in them. Just the market is just so brutal, you guys. Rudy, when are you going to start making custom thumbnails for your videos? I don't... I'll be honest with you guys. The thumbnails, the description. If you ever get bored, look at the tags I put on my YouTube videos. Sometimes I just make up funny stuff. It's kind of funny. I don't care about that. I don't think it matters. Rudy, let's say exactly 12 hours after this Q&A goes live, Wizards announces that they're going to start reprinting random cards from the reserve list. How do you feel? What would you do? Nothing. It's not going to affect anything. Like I said earlier, it's going to be different art, different card frame, different card stocks. going to suck anyways. Doesn't bother me. If the prices go down, I'll buy more. Rudy, what was your first investment in Magic? Or was it first investment in general? I think it was first investment in general. And whatever happened to the large-breasted hot chick with the long hair on your YouTube channel? Uh, I am still with that young lady. Um, we've been trying to think about ways to have her pop more in the videos. We've come up with some good ideas. You're probably going to see her show up in some videos pretty soon. But we don't want to overdo it. We want to make it like special or a surprise. But uh, yeah, she's still around. She still has long hair and she still has big boobs. And uh, they're great. And they're real. Actually, they used to be bigger. I told you guys. I remember she got a reduction before I met her. Joke's on me, right? All right. Um, oh, yeah. First investment and in how much? I mean, I didn't really... I can't remember. The first biggest investment was probably like revised booster boxes and mirage boxes. Oh, my timer's going off. It lets me know my video is about to cut off pretty soon. So, as far as Wall Street investments, probably going to have to be, I did mutual funds and bonds at the beginning, so I want to get my feet wet. I didn't really know what I was doing. 